We turn in our scriptures now to the reading of them as we find it in Psalm 103. Psalm 103. text that we have is the 13th verse. God gives us that as our text for this morning. A psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in love and mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth, For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. May God bless our reading of his word. The 13th verse, Psalm 103, verse 13, serves as our text for this morning. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Even if the first part of this psalm was not included in the Lord's Supper form, in all likelihood it would still be one of the most favorite of God's people, most familiar. The psalmist tells us that we ought to speak well of him. That's what the word bless the Lord, bless means. Speak well of him. And it calls us to do that, especially for his forgiving us. That's the first part. And that's unlikely, in all likelihood, the main reason why that part of the psalm is quoted at the conclusion of the administration of the sacrament of Lord's Supper. It emphasizes forgiveness. But now, in our text, it goes one step further, and if you will, deeper. It goes, what's behind this activity of forgiving? And that is that the Lord 
as a father pities us. Remember that relationship and connection as we go through the sermon. He forgives. But that forgiveness is rooted in his pity. Forgives because he is full of pity for his children. Forgives because of pity. Now we want to consider the text, and we want to do that first looking at Jehovah's pity, and then at an earthly father's pity. And those are the two points we're going to use in the course of the sermon. But what is so interesting is we begin a sermon and an explanation of what we learn here. We've got to go the direction of the text. This is one of the few Old Testament passages that identifies God as Father. Now, the New Testament is full of it. And undoubtedly, that's because God revealed Himself in His only begotten Son. That's why the Old Test New Testament would have that. And that's why Jesus, when He taught us to pray, wants us to be conscious of that relationship. Now, the reason why is because God, throughout all of history, all of the history recorded in the Scriptures, doesn't throw everything that He is about Himself to us in one big bundle first. But His revelation of Himself is gradual. He reveals parts, bits and pieces, increases the revelation, and enables us to make a progression of our understanding of Him, and especially our understanding of Him in His relationship to His people. Starts out as the seed of the woman. But He reveals Himself, first of all, as Creator. And then he gets, increases that revelation. He reveals himself as the covenant God to Abraham. Now, there was that covenant that he had, of course, before with Adam. But now he becomes more specific in it. So the revelation of God gradually increased. Now, he was always to all of his people everything that he is, even though his revelation of that was by, in a progressive revelation. What is most interesting is that our text has us look at the picture in order to get the reality. Now, that's normally backwards. You can't get a picture without a reality. Just take, just take those ultrasound pictures that they take of a infant in the womb. If there's no infant, there's no picture of it. And the picture of it tells you, yes, there's a reality. There's something there. It's alive. It's growing. Tiny though it may be. And that's true of all pictures. You don't have a picture except there's a reality. But now in our text, he starts with the picture. As a father pities his children. And undoubtedly, the reason why that's the case goes from the picture and implies the reality is because that's the experience that every one of his earthly children have. Their understanding of the invisible Father is gained first by the visible earthly Father.
while only the Father is mentioned, we understand, of course, that that's not without our understanding and including all of the characteristics that a mother would add to that. But our Almighty God, who has both of those characteristics of a father and mother, is nevertheless pleased to have him known, not as a mother, but as a father, who has all of the attributes of both parents. Now, what is a father? What really characterizes a father? The little child learns about learns of his of his or her father that they are full of tender love. And if I can jump to the end of the sermon, that makes you shudder. What my children learn about a father is that they see tender love. But nevertheless, that's the case. Tender love as a father holds his little daughter as he looks at that face and is filled with love for it. A love that vows to protect it. A love that vows to do everything he can for it in spite of all the knowledge of his limitations because there is such a love for that child. Some fathers, some children don't see their fathers because of divorce or death. Even Adam learned about fatherhood as he watched the animals. Every age of animals were there. And as he had to name them, he saw them. So that immediately after this man who had no earthly father received unto himself his wife, he heard God say, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. He learned about fatherhood from the animals. There are times when we don't have the picture that's painted for us so beautifully here. And every single one of us can look at times in our relationships to our Father and shiver. I hate to tell you how many times I've been told that there are people who do not want to sing the first stanza of Psalter number 278. Because their father abused them or their father did not protect them from abuse or they didn't have a father that was visible for one reason or another nevertheless the all wise all wise God inspired David 
to write these words in order to teach us that no earthly picture or image of God, of God's unparalleled tender love, is given better than that of an earthly relationship between a father and his children. And the vow that fathers and mothers take at baptism to say yes is a commitment to reflect God's fatherhood. Now, the word, the, the key word that's used in this verse is the word pity. Do you want to be pitied? Most of us aren't so happy with that word. Those who are Handicapped, those who have others address them in a patronizing way, resent pity. Give me respect. Identify me for who I really am. Don't give me pity. Don't feel sorry for me. And the concept as we in that word pity as we use it today is one of condescension we might even say what a pity but the word that's translated pity is obviously correctly understood the hebrew word is correctly understood in every versification of that verse in the Psalter, 278. That word pity refers, let me, let me say it this way first. The word pity has the concept and emphasis of softness. Some have described it as the, the inside of a womb, of the uterus. There is a softness that embraces that infant within the womb. It's a, it's a softness of attitude that soothes, that comforts, that cherishes. So the word communicates gentle, tender affection. And the words of 278 hit the nail on the head. The tender love a father has. Tender and kind is the way 283 has it. 284, same thing. Tender and kind. that accurately communicates what the Hebrew word that's translated pity communicates. God's pity is a most beautiful virtue. His pity is the key aspect of his eternal fatherhood. Eternally. Our Father is soothing, kind, gentle. Now, now get that. Now, now let's see the contrast. Think of how Elijah communicated when he talked to the prophets of Baal. The God of the Scriptures, our God, is not a God of wood and stone, he is not untouched and without feeling toward his children, especially when they hurt. He never ceases to feel toward us with a love that is of the most tender sort. Someone 
wrote it this way. He has a melting compassion for his children. He looks at us as he sees us in our weakness, in our suffering, in our misery, and in our sin. That's the way he looks at us when he sees us in those conditions. He feels towards us this soft, soothing, comfort feeling. He responds to us. Now, what were the first things we said in the introduction? What grows out of pity? Forgiveness. Now apply that. When God exercises this pity, this tender, affectionate love, it's not when we're physically hurting or emotionally drained and depressed and discouraged. It's most often expressed when we're sinning. When we're wrongly feeling sorry for ourselves. When we're actively, consciously doing something that's deliberately wrong. When we are what we really are by nature. That old man. Then God wants us to know that the attitude that he has toward us is this, pity, tender, compassionate love. He looks at us this way when he sees us, yes, with weakness and suffering, yes, in misery, yes, when we sin. And that's what makes this virtue of God so Unbelievable. It's unbelievable because he does it to those who are naturally the children of wrath. Ephesians 2 verse 3. Psalter number 280 uses this expression. Tender love, tender and kind. 280 is a little different. He pities our woes. That's what we sing. He pities our woes. That's their translation of he pities. And it's in that pity. It's because he has that attitude of the tenderest love and compassion for his children when they sin that occasions his sending his only begotten son to take upon himself our sins. Jesus doesn't just deliver us from a wrong attitude about troubles and sorrows and afflictions. Jesus comes out of God's pity to save us from our sins. When you read this or sing this again, then it's almost like you have to do it with your head bowed. Because God's pity implies a death blow to our pride. Tender and kind is because I'm a sinner. Because I don't forget my natural face. And he's always pitying us. Always. Our deepest woe isn't some physical ailment, some handicap. Our deepest woe 
is our sinfulness. Now, that being God's pity, that being God's softness, His tender love, that is precisely what it means to be a father and a mother. But father, we must never think as fathers or grandfathers that it's the mothers who can do the tender part, that we're excused from that. Now immediately, we have to say this, earthly fathers are not to be the pattern that we want our children to reflect. We don't want to teach our children, be like me. We always want our children to be like the Heavenly Father, and especially our sons. Be like the Heavenly Father. Look at Him. Through me, see Him. See Him. Through me, see Him. And as soon as we think that, then every earthly father must have this focus, and mother as well must have this focus. I want to learn what it is that my heavenly father has toward me. Pity, tender, soft compassion, tender love. We must work to cultivate in our own mind increasingly a right understanding of God's parenting, of God's fathering of us. We have to look at what it means that He is to me, that then I might know how to reflect Him to my children and grandchildren. Not, this is what I did, this is what I accomplished. No, Him. This is what he did. This is what he accomplished. This is his attitude and reflection towards you. And he never says, quit bugging me. He never says, you're getting on my nerves. He never explodes. So that if he stops shouting, it's deathly quiet in the house. To be a father is far, far more than just providing for their physical needs. I worked hard all day. I brought the money home so that you can have your clothes, have your toys, have your games, have your education. It's far more than that. We must prayerfully create an atmosphere and a climate within our homes fathers of spiritual warmth of a tenderness and an affection we must work hard so that we don't allow distance resentment and ill will to be the atmosphere of our relationship with our older children especially and a father is the one who bears primary responsibility for that. No young adult, no teenager may ever blame the father. Not when he stands before God, he won't be able to. But a father setting that responsibility of the child aside must know his responsibility as he stands before God. 
that he will be held responsible for what happens between himself and his children. He must ever work to develop and maintain a relationship, let's call it this way, covenant closeness. That's the tender love. That's the friendship and fellowship, the loving friendship and fellowship, the spiritual warmth of Christ so that our children see Him in us. They're going to get their first impression of Him through us. That's unavoidable. What do they see about God? What do they know about their Heavenly Father? What am I communicating to them as a father and a mother? Am I determined that my children see this pity in me? Or do they see themselves getting on my nerves? And then I have to ask the question, does God get on, do I get on God's nerves? Or does he always filled with pity? And the answer is, He's always filled with pity. When our children are used by God to try us, to teach us to develop in the most difficult times, God is using our children and their sinfulness to be occasions and opportunities God-given opportunities for us to develop and to exercise an understanding of the kind of infinite patience and understanding that God has for me. As God forgives, I must forgive. As God loves, I must love. As God pities, I must pity. Now, if I am always soft and tender and kind to my children, they're not going to know that I'm the head and I'm the boss. Really? Sometimes we divide wrongly. Headship and tender love. He maintains headship and tender love, and they're always together. Always. Maybe we have some learning to do, but we must never say, they got to know. And then use that as an excuse to have no tender love, no pity. God maintains both at the same time, always, and he calls us to do the same. And when an insightful father or mother looks at their children in their sins and sees their sins reflected in their children and their children doing what they learned, then there is no more reason for us to be tender and understanding and compassionate. Not frustrated and not extra angry. But again, as we parent, we must always have as our focus 
What do we want our children to have in their understanding about God? What kind of conception do we want our children to have of our and their Heavenly Father? So we have to keep learning more and more from the Scriptures about God's attitude toward us and make that the huge book that's before us that we strive to reflect. That's the kind of father I must always want to be. That's the kind of mother I must always want to be. Him reflected through me to them. Three things by way of conclusion. First, Do you know the spiritual strength of confessing your sins to your children? Do you know how spiritually immature and weak you are when you don't confess? They know, they know you know, and yet you won't admit it. How childish, spiritually immature, how macho, spiritually macho. To tell them you're sorry. That doesn't excuse their sins, and that does not make you weak. Every believing child knows that his father and mother are not perfect, but they have every right to expect us to be honest. And sincere. And the reason why this is the first conclusion is because who doesn't have a million reasons to say, I'm sorry? And not wait until your deathbed. Now, two, God, in his infinite wisdom, gives us this text today, February 26, 2017. And he gives it to us to begin, to try more, to start all over. to do what he calls us to do. He wants us to realize, and he's done this to us many times, everything of the past is gone. I have forgiven. Maybe your children haven't, but I have. They're gone. I have cast your sin into the depths of the sea. It's forever gone. And now we start anew. And the, the choice of this passage of Scripture does that. And it does it every time he brings a word to us. Here we're going to start all over. There's a part of the form that as I read it caught my attention. By renewing, I, I, I forget where it was. You ought to find it. Not only that we know, but that we be renewed. And that's the expression that's constantly used in 
our thinking about putting off and putting on by the renewing of our minds. God gives us an opportunity to renew. Now, the basis of this new effort is this. Not, not the grief of my sin. Yes, that's a part. I'm not going to get rid of that. I may not forget that. But there's this. The absolute tremendous joy that whenever I look up, whenever I look at Him as He's revealed Himself, then this is what He shows me. He is so soft. He is filled with such tender compassion. Not just in the activity of giving Jesus, but in the way He treats us. The way He forgives he forgives, He forgives as He looks at us. When we're sinning. He's always drawing us to Himself in that tenderest love. And the more that we consider God's pity, the more we're going to be moved to exercise that pity to our children. Look up and thank Him. Third, the experience. God is always, 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 eternally always, and was always and will always have this pity, this tender love. But the experience of that love of God, that softness, epitomized in Jesus, is only in the way of our fear of Him. He pitieth them that fear Him. When our children see us striving to reflect God's tender love, that's when they're going to be encouraged to be in awe. Now, I, we can be in awe of God because of His vastness, of His immenseness, of His greatness, of the kind of knowledge He has, of His wisdom. We can be in awe of that. The text wants us to be in awe of Him as we increasingly understand correctly His attitude toward us. Increasingly understand what His attitude toward us is. This pity, this tender love, this softness. And the more you understand it correctly, the more fear all you have of him. Now, that fear of Jehovah is the awareness that that's right here all the time. Always. And that I'm obliged to be thanking him for it. But the fear of Jehovah is the, is the necessary attitude we must have in order to experience it. What what do you want f for Elizabeth more than anything? What do you want your children to have more than anything? May it be that they have a right understanding of their father, the real one, the perfect one that every single one of us has. Amen. Gracious God, in that mercy, in that pity that Thou hast described Thyself to have, hear our prayer. Forgive. And Thou dost. Thou hast declared that Christ came 
that thou wilt not hold our sins against us. Now may we be infinitely more grateful, striving to reflect thee, so that our children see thee better. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.